Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you'll move on this listener right now in your gentle, loving, powerful, and merciful way as they listen to this message from All Nations Church in Tallahassee. Amen. Today we're talking about engaging with the Holy Spirit by living in the Holy Spirit. By allowing Him to control and dominate our lives. By being filled with the Holy Spirit every single day. In John 14, 16, Jesus said, I'll pray the Father. He'll give you another helper that He may abide with you forever. Forever. Helper literally means, and it's translated from the Greek at parakletos, it literally means someone who comes forward on behalf of another, as a representative of one another, who is called alongside to assist. That word has such depth and meaning in the Greek. It can also be translated comforter, counselor, attorney, encourager, advisor, Pleader, proxy, advocate. I don't know about you, but in that list of names, I'm sure one of them resonates in your spirit. You need Holy Spirit to be your helper, your comforter, your advocate, your attorney, your encourager, your inviter, your proxy, your counselor. Every one of us find one or more of those names resonating in our hearts. Matthew 3.11, John the Baptist, when speaking about Jesus, said, He that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to unlatch. And he, speaking of Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. You know why we have so many complacent believers in the church, believers who are afraid to talk about Jesus? It's because we haven't been baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Acts 1.8, Jesus said to the disciples, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you will be witnesses unto me. You'll receive that power to make you a witness. Listen, friend, we need power in the church today. We need to understand the dynamic of God at work in this earth at this time is Holy Spirit. And He comes with power and might to transform us, to encourage us, to change us, and to give us courage. Have you realized that in our culture, believers need courage? Because everything that's coming through culture is the antithesis of what the Bible tells us to be. I came again to tell you this morning, men can never be women. Women can never be men. There's something wrong up here and in here when we think that that's accurate and true. I've come to tell you this morning that men should not be competing in women's athletics. There's something wrong up here or in here when we believe that to be true. We've got to come to the place where we have enough courage that we can stand against culture. On another note, right now, almost every government in the world is standing against Israel. They're saying it's genocide. Can I tell you that's an absolute lie from the pit of hell? Israel was attacked on October 7th. Horrific things occurred, and they rose up and they said, we're going to destroy this terrorist organization that has its headquarters in Gaza. Do you realize in 1995, Israel gave Gaza back over to the Palestinian Authority? And when they gave it back, it was a beautiful place. It was a vacation spot right on the Mediterranean. People came from across the world to enjoy the beaches and the culture And the great things are in Gaza. But the minute Hamas took it over, they began to destroy everything that was good, everything that was right, everything that had been created by Israel, and now they're screaming for a ceasefire. I pray that Israel doesn't stop until that terrorist organization is destroyed. Listen, friend, Israel has every right to be in that land. People say, well, they weren't a nation until 1948. You need to go back and read the Bible. 
Because in 1360 B.C., Joshua crossed the Jordan River with the children of Israel and took the land that had been promised them by God the Father. Come on, stop believing the lies through the press. Start reading the Word of God and give, have courage to stand against these lies. Jesus wanted to say in John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. We talked about this two, two weeks ago. Jesus said it's for your advantage, for your good, for your profit, for your benefit that I go to heaven. Because when I go, I'm sending Holy Spirit. He will empower you. He will guide you. He will instruct you. He will enable you. Oh, come on, somebody. We need to understand the role of the Holy Spirit is great in the church today. We need to stop minimizing who he is and what he does. And open our hearts and welcome all that he has for us. The word nevertheless that Jesus uses in that scripture is a word that he uses to get the attention of the disciples. To tell them, listen to what I'm about to tell you because this is life changing. And then he said, it's to your advantage that I go away. It's for your benefit that I go away. It's for your profit that I go away. Because then Holy Spirit will come. Listen, folks, I talked to a young man this last summer. He had been to church a few times and he was a bit confused. He came out of a nominal church and he said, in the church I was raised in, they only talked about Jesus. We never heard about the Holy Spirit. And that's the problem. Jesus is our Savior. He came born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross as a substitutionary death for our sins. And he rose again on the third day. But hear me, the active agent of the Godhead today on planet earth is Holy Spirit. And we need to talk about him. We need to encourage him to move in our lives. Come on, church. It's time to stop being closet Pentecostals and let the power of God flow through our lives. Because he gives us power to be witnesses. Power to be witnesses. Now, there was no way the disciples were thinking this is a good thing that Jesus would leave because they had followed him for so long. They believed in him. They trusted him. They heard his words. But when the rubber met the road, they walked away. They denied him. They cursed his name. And that's why Jesus said 40 days after he rose from the dead, go to Jerusalem, wait for the power that's on high. You'll be filled with the Holy Spirit and receive power. What happened? When they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, power fell on them. Cloven tongues as a fire. A mighty wind swept through the house where they were sitting. Oh, somebody hear me this morning. It's time once again to say, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. A.W. Tozer said years ago, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on. But if the Holy Spirit were withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop. See, there's got to be a line of demarcation. There's got to be a place where we say, I've experienced God to the extent that I am transformed. I am changed. I'm not the man or the woman I used to be. God's done something in me that will not allow me to go back and wallow in sin. Not allow me to go back and throw pity parties. He's done something in me that will not keep me silent. I got a fire shut up in my bones and I've got to proclaim it. Oh, somebody, it's time. To be filled with the Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit. Evangelicals, and we're considered evangelicals, generally put the Holy Spirit in one of three categories. Number one, they seem obsessed with Him. And I tell you, there has been excesses in the Pentecostal charismatic church. People thinking they're in the Spirit, we're in the flesh, 
And they actually brought reproach to the name of God. I'll never forget the lady who came to church one Sunday and said to me, Pastor, I just cast a demon out yesterday. Well, that's wonderful. That's what you're supposed to do. And then she went on to say, I captured him in a jar, and I put the jar in the stool, and I flushed him down the stool. How ludicrous is that? And then I said to her, I wish you wouldn't have done that. Because we got a guy that works at the sewer plant. Now he's going to have to deal with it. See, we need to understand it's not about being ludicrous, outrageous, nuts. There are way too many granola bar Christians in the church today. All fruits and nuts. We need a genuine outpouring of the Spirit of God that isn't just some ecstatic moment, but it changes our life. It's not how high you jump in worship. It's how straight you walk when you go out these doors. That's what Holy Spirit does for us. Others believe in the Holy Spirit, but they act, relate towards Him the same way they relate to their pituitary gland, right here at the front of the brain. They're grateful it's there. They know what it does, but they never think about it, not even once. That's the way they are with the Holy Spirit. They're grateful He's here. They're glad for what he do, He's done, but they never even think about Him. And then there are those that we call sensationists, cessationists, pardon me, who believe that the works and the gifts of the Holy Spirit passed with the canonization of Scripture. And they base that on one verse of Scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 10, where Paul wrote, when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will pass away. But they missed the part where Paul said, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you all. They missed the part where Jesus said the Holy Ghost will come and empower and indwell. I've come to tell you this morning, the works and the gifts of the Holy Spirit of God have not passed away. He's simply waiting for spirit-filled believers to stand up and say, use me. In the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, use me in the gifts of healing and miracles. Use me in prophecy and tongues and interpretation. It's time to have courage to stand up. You say, well, I'm afraid that might bring a little wildfire into this place. I'd much rather have wildfire than no fire. Come on. It's my job to manage the wildfire. It's your job to let it burn. Let it burn. He'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. The Bible tells us there are two ways we can shortcut the workings of the Spirit or stop the workings of the Holy Spirit. Number one, Ephesians 4, 30 and 31. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. We shouldn't grieve the Holy Spirit. How do we grieve the Holy Spirit? He tells us in the last verse. By allowing bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander to rule our lives. We're supposed to put that stuff away when Holy Spirit comes in. Do away with it. Let Him eliminate it. Take it from our lives. To grieve the Spirit means to make Him sad or sorry. And we grieve Him by holding stuff in our life that is not of righteousness, is not of godliness, doesn't align with the Word of God. Folks, it's time to put some stuff out so He can come in. He's looking for vessels He can fill. And here's the great news. When He comes, there's a wind that sleeps your house clean. And there's a fire that purifies you and sanctifies you and makes you children of the Most High God. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. So all these things are general. They are, but let me give you a personal application. As a young man growing up, I had huge anger issues. Anything would set me off. 
I was willing to fight anybody at any time at the drop of a hat, and there was a lot of times I dropped the hat. I was angry and mean before I came to know Jesus. Matter of fact, there was one time when a preacher, and I vowed I would never be a preacher. I don't want to do that. I don't want that on my life because all I saw was bad news in the pulpit. A preacher dressed my sister, my oldest sister, up and down. He may as well cussed her out. She came home in tears. And when I heard the story, I drove up to the house where he lived and knocked on the door with a 12-gauge shotgun in my hand. And I said, if you ever, I was filled with anger and wrath, if you ever do that to a member of my family, you'll answer to me. And then you're going to answer to God because I'm going to send you to eternity. (laughs) Anger drove my life. When I got saved, the emotion of anger didn't leave, but God gave me the ability to control it, to harness it, and to make it an energy that works for Him. Paul said, be angry and sin not. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Holy Spirit helps us with those things in our lives. We can grieve Him when we don't allow Him to deal with that junk. Secondly, we can quench the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.19, do not quench the Spirit. To quench means to put out the fire. Throw a wet blanket on it. That's too radical. I don't like their worship. There was a guy several years ago who said to me, I don't like your worship. I said, well, then why are you coming? Because of the presence of God. Listen, folks, what your opinion of the songs we sing in worship is not relevant. Did you hear me? It's not relevant. What's relevant is you usher in the presence of God, and then you'll learn that those words lead you deeper into His presence, and you'll begin to worship Him as never before. And when you do, your life is transformed. You're changed. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. Don't throw a wet blanket over what He's doing. We quench Him when we ignore Him continuously. When we push Him out of our lives. When we allow our morals and biblical values to be compromised, we quench Him. May I tell you? Oh, here we go. He's going to meddle again. God doesn't want you living together. If you're committed to each other, come to me. Get married. Do it right so God can bless your life. He's not going to bless that relationship when you're out of relationship with Him. Hear me. Premarital sex is still a sin. Separates you from God. I fired a guy some years ago because he told me there was nothing wrong with premarital sex. Are you kidding me? It's absolutely against Scripture. The word in Scripture is fornication. Stop sleeping with people you're not married to. Oh, but I love him. Well, if you love him, come to me and let's get you married. Let's fix that problem. Let's fix what's out of joint in your life. And you know what I find most of the time? They really don't love him. It's a relationship of convenience. A relationship that strokes the need in their hearts. I know this isn't easy stuff, but we need to understand when we engage with the Holy Spirit and begin to live with the Holy Spirit, we must change. There's no way about it. We can't continue being the people we are, because if we do, we grieve Him. We grieve Him. One of the best ways to make sure we're not grieving the Holy Spirit, you might want to write this down, is keeping short accounts with God and with man. What does that mean? It means when we sin, we confess our sin. And He is faithful and just to forgive us of the sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. It means when we have a spiff with a brother or a sister or another person in the world, we don't sit on it and let it fester. Because any time we respond in anger and don't deal with it, the anger leads to bitterness. The bitterness leads to rebellion against God. Rebellion against God leads to what Jesus said was murder. If you hate a brother, you've committed murder. 
Well, I've never read that. Well, you might try reading the Sermon on the Mount. It's there, I promise you. Matthew 5, 6, and 7, it's there. We need to understand that we can't quench the Holy Spirit by not confessing our sin. Let me say it this way. When you mess up, own it. When you sin, confess it. When you've hurt someone else, go make it right. Because then God can move in your life. Unconfessed sin of a believer is like an open wound. It rots progressively. And the odor begins to rise from that wound that is absolutely repelling to other people and to God. God is waiting to restore relationships. And he's waiting. What's he waiting for? He's waiting for you to ask him. He's waiting for you to confess to him. He's waiting for you to open your heart and let him cleanse the wound, take out all that repugnance, and make you whole again. It's in your outline, but I want you to remember it. God can never forgive what we don't confess. God can never forgive what we don't confess. See, living in the Spirit requires repentance. If we're going to live by the Holy Spirit, we need to walk with the Spirit. Galatians 5.25 says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. That literally means keep step with. Rodney, would you come please? Keep step with. That's a military term. It means we're all walking step to step. We're walking in cadence. We're walking together. We're hearing the commands of the master and we're doing what he's asking us to do. We are walking in step with him. We need to understand that God has called us in Matthew chapter 3 verse 8 to display the fruits of repentance. What are the fruits of repentance? Changed attitudes. Changed lives. Changed influence and input into your life. Changed friends that are not taking you in the right direction. I'd ask Rodney if he would come this morning and share his testimony of salvation and deliverance. It's powerful. Good morning. When I got the text at 8.30 this morning, Mm -hmm. (laughs) it brought about some apprehension and some anxiety, and then it brought about excitement. Amen. And joy. Amen. Uh, When I was six years old, long time ago, because of the teachings of my mama and my grandmama, I heard the word of God. I was convict, convicted as a sinner and convinced I needed a savior. I heard the word of God, believed it, and convinced Jesus as my savior. And I've been saved ever since. But I came out of one of those churches that he was talking about that didn't teach on the power of the Holy Spirit. That we could have power over sin. And I got, there's a lot, there's a lot of ways I could go. And I've got five minutes, so the Holy Spirit has to help me here. But uh, my mom and dad split and got divorced when I was a young man, not so long after that. And eventually, me and my brother, I've got three sisters and two and one brother me and my brother went to live with my dad who was not a church going man so i wasn't in fellowship it is very important to be in fellowship amen in the church so i got involved in worldly activities i got addicted to drugs alcohol cigarettes um, immorality just the whole deal i was saved I was miserable, but God never turned away from me, even when I turned away from him. I found myself, uh, and I'm divorced as well. I got married, and and I'm so glad I did. I've got a wonderful daughter and three grandchildren. God is so good. Amen. But I found myself living with my girlfriend uh, for like four years as a Christian, a believer, and I was tormented 
in the alcohol and the drugs and the immorality. And I found myself four years into this, I was on the back porch and I held a job and I made money and I lived and survived, but I was miserable. I found myself on the back porch, smoking a joint, drinking a beer, reading my Bible. Look, God knows everything. He loves us, right? And I read, I remember reading, all those that say unto me, Lord, Lord, will not enter into the kingdom of heaven, but those that do the will of Amen. my Father. That's right. And it shook me. And so I prayed and I asked God to deliver me out of this relationship or lead me to marry her. Mm -hmm. Within... I don't know, two weeks, she left. I came home and there was, you know, dust balls on the floor where furniture used to be. And my dogs were gone. And uh, it hurt. It, it, it really hurt. I knew that's what I wanted. And I knew it was God, but it was extremely painful. The Bible says... When you have sex with somebody, even if it's a harlot, that you become one flesh. Come on. That's right. So when you sever that relationship, it, it hurts. Yeah. So I was laying on my bed, like for three days I was just miserable, depressed. And I was laying in the bed, crying, grown man, macho man. And... Uh, I just, I just started pondering the word of God and I remember where it said he would not leave us comfortless. And I said, I just yelled, I yelled at him. I was kind of mad actually. And I said, you said you would not leave me comfortless. Comfort me, comfort me. I yelled at him and immediately a, a heat came around my heart. Come on. I'll never forget it. The depression left. I was filled with joy. I'd never, I'd been to Christian Heritage when it was at the other place one time with them lifting the hands and shouting and everything. And uh, I, I didn't come out of that kind of church activity. But I jumped up out of the bed and started dancing around like a crazy Pentecostal. Mm. Amen. Because I was free from the depression and, the, and I, I knew... You can't tell me the Holy Spirit's not real. Come on. You can't tell me. And uh, I could go on and on, but my life changed. People, old friends would come to me and say, look, look, we're going on the weekend. It's all on me. I got cocaine. I got all this stuff. I said, I can't do that no more. Mm, amen. I don't want to do that no, anymore. And I'm not, I'm not saying... He delivered me from all that stuff. But because of things that I judge other people for, he allowed some of the stuff to come back temporarily. So I had to get delivered again from a couple of things. And uh, a lot of people, when people talk about deliverance, they think of demons that would just have to be delivered from demons. Right. It's not just demons. We got to be delivered from all different kinds of trouble. Come on. The Bible says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Uh, Psalm 107 said, there was four different type people who found themselves needing deliverance. Some because of their foolishness and their rebellion. Others, it was no fault of theirs. They just found themselves in a bad situation, but they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. Yeah. And he delivered them out of their distresses. It's a lifestyle of deliverance. Come on. That's right. We find ourselves in pain, in affliction, in our bodies, and we want to be delivered from that pain. And recently, well, for the past year and a half or so, I've been going through a lot of physical affliction. And to this day, I'm now thankful for that. Yeah. Amen. It has strengthened my relationship with God. And I'm thankful that he allowed me to, allows me to go through affliction because it makes me more dependent upon him and it, it tamps down my 
arrogant flesh. Amen. My pride and my arrogance. Because like he was saying, there's, there's things that will quench the Holy Spirit. Pride and arrogance is the number one. That's where all the issues come from. Yeah. Pride and arrogance, unforgiveness, bitterness. But I'm here to tell you today, I was praying about a month ago. I was in severe pain. A lot of things going on. And God spoke to me and he said, Rodney, I know you want to be delivered. I know you want to be delivered. And I will deliver you. Just wait and see. Come on. And he told me to tell you what I'm telling you. He told me to tell you this. I knew there would be an opportunity to tell you. But he told me, he said, the thing that's caused you pain and trouble is working for your good. Come on, that's right. You're becoming more like Christ. You know, it, the Bible says that Jesus learned obedience through suffering. Mm -hmm. But he told me to tell you, he told me this. He said, Rodney, I love you. Mm -hmm. I love you. He said, I, I purchased you. You're mine. No one or no thing can take you from me. That's right. I love you. I think about you all the time. He said, he said, my thoughts to you are all good. My thoughts about you are all good. Not evil. You're not being punished. And I'm, I'm speaking to people who want to be delivered from something. Amen. Not people who are happy in their Amen. situation, but people who fear the Lord and want to be delivered. Amen. Don't dwell on your own thoughts about the matter. Because this, remember Paul said three times he prayed to be delivered from that thorn in the flesh. And, and Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you. It was there to tamp down his haughtiness and his pride and keep him humble. But God said, if you were to count the thoughts towards you that I think towards you, it would be as the sand. Right. Period. Not the sand of the seashore, right. but all the sand. The sand of the deserts and everything else. So therefore, what he was saying was, I think about you all the time. Amen. And it's good. It's for your future. Yes. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Don't let your affliction take you out of the will of God. Don't become bitter about it. Run towards God. He Amen. loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves Amen. us. Let the redeemed of the Lord Amen. say so. Yeah, come on. Even after, the, in, in Psalm 107, he said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Right. After they were redeemed, they wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way with no place to live. And they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. Amen. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. He loves us. Amen. Don't dwell on your thoughts of inad inadequacy. He said, he told me, he said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Right. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. What you think has disqualified you is strengthening you. In your weakness, he shows himself strong. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Rodney. I know he is speaking to people here today. I wanted him to share that testimony because there are so many who are living in a place of absolute falsehood. He said it right. Jesus said, if you say, Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I tell you to do, I have no part in you. Folks, somebody may have told you when you were six or nine or 15 years old that you're good. If you're not living in relationship with Jesus Christ, he doesn't know you. You've got to come to the place where you push aside things that distract you from the living God and convince you that you're right. So I'm going to give you two steps as we conclude this morning to living in the spirit. There's actually six of them, but I knew the time and figured, you know, there's so see can the mind can only comprehend what the seat can endure. So we're not going to do all six of them. Next week we'll do the other four. So here we go. How do we be live in the spirit? We are filled with the spirit. We must be filled with the spirit. It's so easy to fill our lives with things that don't satisfy. Some of us are drinking deeply from substances that end up controlling us rather than the Spirit to fill our lives. 
Ephesians 5.18 says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Read that. By extension, he's saying, get drunk on the Holy Ghost. Drink in so much that you're changed. The command literally, when he says be filled with the Spirit, literally means keep on being filled with the Spirit. Let me blow this bad theology aside. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is not a one-time experience. It's every single day and sometimes multiple times in that day. When you're tempted, Spirit of God, fill me. When you're angry, Spirit of God, fill me. When you're discouraged, Spirit of God, fill me. When you're confused, Spirit of God, fill me. When you don't know what to do, Spirit of God, fill me. Spirit of God, fill me. You look at this glass this morning, and most of you would tell me it's empty, right? There's nothing in it. But that's not correct. It's not empty. It's filled with the atmosphere. It's filled with the environment. It's filled with the things around it. So what do we need to do to get the air, the atmosphere, the environment out of this glass? Pump it out. Pump it out, she says. That won't work, Jada, because if you pump it out, you create a vacuum and that shatters the glass. How do we get the air out of this glass? Turn it upside down. Turn it upside down. Yes. Now, these aren't their responses. I gave them to them. But (laughs) may I tell you, that's not rocket science. Because even if you turn it upside down, the air is still there. So how do we get the air out of this glass? Fill it with rocks. Fill it with rocks, she says. You could fill it with rocks. But there's going to be air in between the rocks. So that doesn't work either. How do we get the air out of this glass? Fill it with water. Fill it with water, he says. That's exactly right. And water is the Holy Ghost in our life. Fill our lives with him until we're brim full. And then when we're facing the problems of life that tend to suck the life out of us, when we're facing temptations, when we're facing culture, when we're facing things that are not of God and things begin to drain away from us, what do we do? We come back and we say, fill me again. Fill me again. Fill me again. And we ask him to do it again and again and again and again until he overflows in our life, until he's in control of our life, until there's no more room for the things of the world. You know how you live godly in Christ Jesus? By being filled with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Bailey. Thank you, Jada, Carson, Nate, and Selena. I appreciate that. By being filled with the Holy Spirit. And secondly, we live in the Spirit by being purified. Tom, would you come back? Purified by the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.16 says, Walk by the Spirit and you'll not gratify the desires of your flesh. We read that, we hear that. It's absolutely true. Be purified by the Spirit. Holy Spirit's presence is a purifying agent in our lives. People have said to me often, I just can't stop doing it. I just can't break it. I just can't get past it. And it's not necessarily alcohol, tobacco, drugs, pornography. Sometimes it's your stinking thinking. And you just can't get past it. I've come to tell you today, the only way to overcome it is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So full that He overflows in your life. And He purifies you. He purifies you. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you're not your own? For we're bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. The way we live when we're full of the Holy Spirit should declare to the world we're different. We're not like you. We're motivated by something else. Let me say it another way. The world will learn about God based on our lives. And they will either think he's a crutch 
he's a cop out, he's a handicap, well, they will think that God is mighty and powerful. I knew that guy before he got saved and got full of the Holy Spirit, and I see him now, and they in no way resemble one another. It's time to be filled with the Spirit so He will purify us. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are God's temple? You being plural, speaking of all of us who are children of God. And that God's Spirit dwells in you. God's Spirit dwells in you. Listen to me. I don't want, I don't want my life to be explainable outside of the Holy Spirit. I want people to say, yeah, we knew him. Yeah, we fought with him. Yeah, we were afraid of him. But that's not the way it is now. The love and the compassion of God flow. And I want what he has. I don't want my life to be explainable outside of the Holy Spirit. And that should be the cry of every one of us in this room today. Stand to your feet with me. Tom's going to sing it out. Holy Spirit, rain down. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you say, I already am. Well, how about a refilling? How about letting Him top off your life? Come on, how about letting Him pour some more in until you overflow? If you want to be filled with the Spirit and live in the Spirit, then as Tom sings, step out and come. Just respond to Him. Step out and come. If you're here and you need to be forgiven, you need to repent. You need to make things right in your life. Step out and come as well. And just say, Lord, forgive me. Cleanse me. Change me. Make me a child of God. As he sings it, step out and come. You made it to the end of the message, and now what? Is God leading you to make a change? Are you needing a good church home where you can grow and help others grow as you fulfill your part in the body of Christ? then we invite you to join us at All Nations Church on Sharer Road in Tallahassee, a multicultural church founded on the truth of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. Our Sunday morning service is at 10.30 and Wednesday night service at 7, plus youth group and kid power and small groups and more. For more information, visit our website, allnationstallahassee.com.